So we're going to move into this chapter 10, and it deals with uh, refrigeration and heat pump cycles. You've been exposed to refrigeration. You've been exposed to heat pump cycles. So a little bit of today's lecture, probably most of its review. But then again, uh, we build on it. Now, we're going to talk today about the vapor compression refrigeration. Are there other ways to do or perform refrigeration? Yes, but this is the workhorse of the industry. If you have an automobile, your air conditioner in the automobile, vapor compression cycle. Do you have a house? Do you have an air conditioner in a house, a window unit or central unit? Vapor compression. Do you have a refrigerator in your kitchen? Does it make ice in the freezer and keep the beverages cold in the refrigerator part? Vapor compression refrigeration. This building somewhere at the UT campus is vapor compression refrigeration to make chilled water to provide air conditioning in this building in the hot summer. All right, so this is the workhorse. Is it the only way to make something cold? No, it's just the predominant way you make it cold in the United States throughout the world, vapor compression. So we're gonna start off by review of the best, C-A-R-N-O-T. What do you think of when you see that word Carnot? You think it's perfect, it's frictionless, it's, it's the best, you can't beat it. And then we're gonna move to something, a practical uh, vapor compression refrigeration. So first we start with the Carnot vapor compression refrigeration. There's four components. Just memorize, sometimes it's good just to memorize these components. You're gonna have, and I'll put them out like this, an evaporator. What's happening in the evaporator? You're adding heat from something that's already cold. That's the, the chore, the goal of refrigeration. Something's cold, but you're still removing heat from it to make it or sustain or keep it cold or make it cold or freeze it. All right, out, out the refrigerant will flow in a loop through the evaporator, and in the evaporator, the refrigerant will pick up heat from the surroundings. Sometimes we put it like this, we'll put in uh, Q dot at the low temperature, or we'll put uh, lowercase q at the low temperature, or even sometimes just cap q without a dot at the low temperature. All three are used. Maybe in chapter two, there was an emphasis on just amount of heat transfer in kilojoules. Uh, maybe the first time you saw it, you looked at the rate at which heat is being removed or added into the refrigerant in the evaporator. Q, Q, Q dot. Or you th think about, hey, we have fluid flowing in a loop, the mass flow rate, and so the lowercase q is Q dot divided by the mass flow rate through the evaporator. You're familiar with all three of these, but sometimes it can be confusing which one is which. Okay, uh, then after the evaporator, you flow into a compressor, and the pressure is boosted. Have you analyzed compressors? Yes, you boost the pressure. It's going to be frictionless, it's going to be uh, hence reversible, and it's also going to be adiabatic, no heat transfer. Hence, when you combine adiabatic and reversible, it's isentropic compression, the best compression you can get. Okay, then you come out, you're going to go into a condenser, and in the condenser, the refrigerant condenses. In order for the refrigerant to condense, you have to reject some heat from it. Again, we can put cap, Q dot for high temperature, you're rejecting it at high temperature, or lowercase Q at high temperature, or just Q at high temperature. Again, what would be the typical units on this Q without a dot? SI units for Q, cap Q subscript L. What would that units be? Kilojoule. What about this one? Kilojoule per kilogram. What about this one? kilowatts. So we have to be multilingual. We have to know how to operate. I forgot to show this compressor doesn't have any heat transfer, but it has work going to it. I'm going to just put a lowercase wc. Okay, I can do the same thing. Cap w dot c, wc, etc. All right. After the condenser, it can go out and in the theoretical Carnot, Vapor compression cycle, it goes through this turbine. All right. That turbine is a work consuming device, and so I'm going to put lowercase wt into the turbine. All right. So those are uh, the four components, 
And now we need to talk about the pressures in the system. The system, you can cut it in half. You could cut it right through here because the turbine drops the pressure, the compressor boosts the pressure. So this is the high pressure side and this is the low pressure side. When we get to our practical vapor compression refrigeration system, we have the same thing. We only have two pressures, high pressure side, low pressure side. So that uh, when we number our states and walk around the system, let's call this state one being consistent with our textbook. This is state two, this is state three, and this is state four. The pressure at four is equal to the pressure at one, it's the low pressure. And likewise, for the high pressure, the pressure at two is equal to the pressure at three. So it's the high pressure in the condenser. Or you just say, oh, the evaporator pressure is this, and the condenser pressure is this. Anybody ever work with the air conditioning system and you worked with a technician, he has a set of gauges, he goes out, hooks them up, he has two dials. Yeah, a couple of you do. You're, you have an advantage over the other students in the class because you have that practical experience. You know what they're doing. They're diagnosing the high pressure or low pressure of the system. They can tell a lot just by the pressure measurements. If it's low on refrigerant or if it's overcharged, or whatever. All right. Okay. So now we have those components. Um, we're going to be interested in the energy transfers. Uh, the um, also a lot of times when we walk we're through the cycle and we analyze it, it helps us if we plot the states on a property diagram. Now there's a lot of property diagrams that are useful in refrigeration. A pressure enthalpy, I'm not going to introduce it today, but the standard that you have a lot of familiarity with is a temperature entropy diagram. We're going to use a refrigerant like 134, refrigerant 22, ammonia. I know we don't use water as a refrigerant. We don't use air typically as a refrigerant. You could, but you don't. You use special fluids that are made that are have better properties. Okay, so the refrigerant let's say 134A or refrigerant, whatever. There's a lot of them out there. Do you think we're going to be changing phase, going from liquid to vapor? Yeah. So let's go ahead and put a dome on this temperature entropy diagram. What's the topmost point in that dome? What do you call that? Critical point. What is the state of all of this side going down? They're all saturated. Saturated vapor, exactly. And then on the other side going down, what is the state of all these? Saturated, saturated liquid. Don't forget the basics. All right. Now, just like I kind of encourage you to go ahead and just memorize the four components and then use the numbering of the states consistent with the textbook. State one is inlet to the compressor. State two is outlet to the compressor. I'm just going to say that it's very consistent. You've already studied the Carnot vapor uh, compression refrigeration cycle. The state two, you're just going to pick it to be saturated vapor. And state uh, three is saturated liquid. That sort of pegs it. It's at the high pressure side. Saturated vapor, state two. Saturated liquid, state three. All right. So if you sketch a line of high pressure, this would be a high pressure line. Where would be state two? Right there. Where would be state three? Right there. Again, on a TS diagram with the dome, you should be able to sketch in a line of high pressure. What is that high pressure? Well, it's the condenser pressure. It's the outlet of the compressor pressure. Okay, now sketch another line, which is the pressure of the low pressure, which is the evaporator pressure. It would be something like this, going across and then going up. That would be our low pressure. Okay, now <clears throat> think about that compressor. And if it's a reversible adiabatic, behavior of that compressor, we know that S1 is equal to S2. Have you enough experience doing analysis of compressors to know, hey, it's S1, it's isentropic, right? So where is state one compared to state two on a TS diagram? Straight below. 
well, why didn't they number, some people will number the outlet of the compressor one. And that way, you know, you kind of peg it as you go through. Like you first figure out where state one is on the diagram. But here it's better to start and put state two on the diagram and then back up to get state one. Likewise, if you go through that turbine, frictionless, adiabatic, isentropic, where is state four? Straight below. Now, when we look at where state four and state one are, are they both under the dome? Yeah, and so they're both two phase. They both have some two phase mixture of liquid vapor. Now, <clears throat> which one has a higher quality? State one or state four has a higher quality? State one has higher quality, meaning by mass, that mixture, a larger fraction of the mixture at state one is in the vapor state. What has a lower quality? Well, state four, by mass, more of it's in the liquid state. If I estimated just visually, I would say, oh, state one looks like about, I don't know, 80% quality from this sketch. And state four looks like 15-20% uh, quality from this sketch, right? Isn't it a ratio of lengths of lines on the TS diagram? Yeah, okay, so we're covering, re re reviewing a lot of material as we go through this. Okay, now we're interested in getting a performance measure. So I'm gonna switch to another screen and we're gonna do a quick review of the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle. Back in chapter two of our textbook, we just had a box. And then we said, oh, we have some heat removed from a low source and heat rejected to a high sink, and it's gonna require some work. And now what we're doing is we're filling in inside the box. Inside the box, down here is gonna be a evaporator. And then we're gonna have a compressor, and then we're gonna have a condenser, and then we're gonna have a turbine in the car now, and the fluid's gonna flow like this. And all of this heat that's brought into the cycle is brought in across a boundary temperature of TL. And all of this heat that's rejected out of the cycle is rejected at a boundary temperature TH. Make sense? Good. Now, we were interested in a metric, a performance metric, a coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle. You may or may not remember that the book used the symbol beta. I am not a fan of the symbol beta for the coefficient of performance. Other textbooks use a different symbol, but it has three letters with one subscript. It's the three letters are COP with the subscript R. It's easier for me to remember that the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle is COP subscript R. I will always ask students, it's like, uh, is it gamma or is it beta? I can't remember what this author chose for the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle in this textbook, because another textbook, they change it up and it's different. So there it is, that's my, my shortfall, <laughs> okay? But what it is, is both of these, uh, either one of these work, but you'll see me using COP subscript R more, more common than beta. But beta is a ratio of what you want the cycle to do. What do you want the cycle to do? Over what you have to feed it to make it work. What you have to pay for it. What is the cost? It's simple, right? So what do you want it to do? Do you want it to heat up the outside of the world or do you want to keep the inside of your refrigerator cold? You, you want to keep the inside of your refrigerator cold. All right. And what do you have to pay for? EPA currently doesn't... Uh, uh, make you pay to dump heat into the environment, they may, within your lifetime, have a penalty, a tax associated with dumping carbon dioxide into the environment. I'm pretty sure it'll happen. I was more sure it was happened a couple years ago, but then it's, you know, it's kind of comes and goes. There'll be a tax on dumping, you know, wasting, dumping junk into the environment, carbon dioxide into the environment. But right now, you have to pay for W. W, that's the energy supplied in the form of work to make this system work. Okay, now we could uh, write this like Q dot, the L or the W dot. 
or you could even write it if you knew what the mass flow rate was flowing through the system, m dot. You could write it like q, lowercase ql over lowercase w. Now, I should emphasize that this is net, net, net. Just what is the total provided? If I just have one input, well, then I don't need the net. It's, it's just one. Okay. Now, if I go and I go do a first law analysis for this system, I have only three energy transfers, two in, one out. So the one out is QH. I'll just leave it without the dot or the subscript, lowercase q, is equal to the one in plus the other in. Is that a good first law? Is it? Okay. Now, the other one is called the second law. Just like I went pretty fast on the first law, I think I can go pretty fast on the second law. I have no entropy generation in a completely reversible system. So, the best is when sigma equal to zero. Frictionless, no irreversibilities. When that happens, we get the relationship that the amount of heat brought in at the low temperature divided by the low boundary temperature at which it's brought into the system, that's all coming in, that entropy transfer in, has to match the entropy transfer out, which is the only way it's going out is with the heat transfer on the high end divided by T high. Do you like that equation? I know it boils down from the second law. Can you kind of read it? It's entropy transfer in equal entropy transfer out. How does it transfer in? Only with QL in. So it's QL divided by TB at that L, that TL. All right. So now I take this equation, and what I can do to my equation for beta, I can get a maximum. The first step is just with the, with the first law. You don't just go ahead and replace w net or w down here and what you'll get is you'll have ql divided by maybe i'll get rid of just do the first law first which is um, uh, qh minus ql you can use that for a system where there's irreversibilities but now we're going to use it only for a system where it's completely reversible because this equation right here allows me to replace the QL over QH is equal to TL over TH. So this is going to be um, uh, QL over QH divided by 1 minus QL over QH. How did I go from this equation to that equation? I, I basically divided both numerator and denominator by QH. Now I can substitute. So that's equal to TL over TH. 1 minus TL over TH, yeah, TH. And now I multiply both sides by numerator, denominator by TH, and I finally get where I wanted to get to, TL divided by TH minus TL. That was a big equation in Chapter 5. Thermal 1, entropy, it was introduced. This is the best, the highest coefficient of performance that you can get for a refrigeration cycle, and it would be for the Carnot. So it's TL divided by TH minus TL. There's a lot of questions I can ask about this equation. Like, for example, uh, what happens if TL is 0 degrees and TH is 100 degrees C? What's beta max? You know, let's play a game or two. You know, if uh, TL is equal to 0 degrees C, and TH is equal to 100 degrees C. What is beta max? I'm going to pause and walk around the room. You show me. You show me. All right, so that's pretty good. It's 2.73. How many people first computed zero and then something's not right? Why? Because you have to put temperature in absolute scale. And so you can't put it in degree C. It has to be absolute. All right. Oh, there it is. There's more questions we could ask, but that's a good review. Now let's go back over here. 
So when we're analyzing a vapor compression refrigeration system, we like a metric, a performance metric. The metric would be beta. We introduced it. This is the Carnot. It's going to get the maximum. And we get TL over TH minus TL. All right, why don't we have more Carnot uh, vapor compression refrigeration systems out there in your automobile, in your kitchens, in your uh, homes? It, it's not practical. It's not practical. Why is it not practical? First of all, there's not a turbine like that. A turbine which takes in a liquid and then comes out with some sort of two-phase mixture of liquid vapor doesn't exist. The other thing is, what do you want to give a compressor? It's just like our, what do you want to feed a pump? Do you want to feed a pump a two-phase mixture liquid vapor? No, don't leave this class without knowing that, please. Pumps like saturated liquids or subcooled liquids. They don't like any vapor. All right, guess what? Same with compressors. Compressors like saturated vapor or superheated vapor. They don't like water droplets or uh, liquid droplets. They can take a few, but they don't like them. So what you do on the practical uh, vapor compression refrigeration is you still have a condenser. You still have an evaporator. You still have a compressor, but you get rid of that turbine because it's not practical and you replace it by something that will accomplish the goal of dropping the pressure remember you're going from high pressure low pressure but you're not going to extract any work out of it well that's an easy device to make and manufacture and put into a system and it's very reliable it's just a valve it's just a valve that's all it is and so here is the change to what we call the some people will call this the practical Carnot vapor compression refrigeration. Well, that's too long. Just call it the vapor compression refrigeration without the Carnot. And so we'll stay with our numbering system. We'll call this state one out of the evaporator into the compressor. Here, we want that compressor to get all vapor. Hence, it's now going to be saturated vapor down here, not at the outlet. Okay, state two. You tell me a little bit. If I feed saturated vapor, to a compressor, what's coming out of the compressor? Superheated vapor. That's exactly right. And then this is now state three. State three is still saturated liquid. Nothing wrong with feeding saturated liquid to an expansion valve. And then state four is after the expansion valve. Well, let's do this. Uh, let's uh, think about doing a first law analysis for the compressor. I know that the sign convention, I'm going to draw this WC into the compressor as positive. Have you had enough experience knowing that, hey, uh, it's not going to have a heat transfer. We're, we're making that standard assumption that the compressors are adiabatic, negligible heat transfer, negligible change in kinetic potential energy. It just boils down to the energy per unit mass that I have to shove into it that provide by the shaft work going into the compressor is simply H2 minus H1. Isn't it you enough experience to know that? Have you analyzed them enough? to change in enthalpy. All right. What about uh, the evaporator? Well, you're bringing in QE. You do a first law around that evaporator, and it's going to come out hot compared to well, not hot, higher enthalpy at H1, saturated vapor, versus the lower enthalpy of uh, two-phase mixture after it's flashed through the expansion valve. Okay, now we're going to stay with the sign consistent with the direction of the arrow shown. So Q in the condenser, that's going to be dumping out. That's going to be the H2 minus the H3. The last one. Is there any work of this expansion valve or any heat transfer with the expansion valve? None, 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 none. So you've analyzed valves before. There's a pressure drop across it, but what's constant? I'm gonna pause and walk around so you can answer that. 
Is it temperature? Is, is T3 equal to T4? Or is it the pressure, P3 equal to P4? Or the specific volume, 3 is equal to V4? Or the enthalpy, 3 equal to enthalpy, 4? Or S3 equal to S4? Uh, you know, what is constant across this expansion valve? In two simple questions. So what it is, is you analyze it and you find out that it's H3 is equal to H4. What do you call that? Is that isothermal? I forgot the name of that one. It's isenthalpic. Ah, yeah, isenthalpic. The flow through the expansion valve is isenthalpic. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and sketch it on a temperature entropy diagram, TS diagram. Should we still put a dome? Sure, put the dome. And should we still put a line, only one line of high pressure, and then only one line of low pressure? Yeah, we have the high pressure, low pressure. We don't now have three pressures. No, there's still only two pressures. But where do we put state one? Low pressure, saturated vapor, right there is state one, isn't it? And now when you go through the compressor, it's isentropic. That would be the best compressor. Guess where state 2 is, or what I call 2S. What happens if they give you an efficiency of the compressor? It's going to kick it off. We would put a dashed line, and it would be over here would be the 2 actual. You'll still need to get it to that pressure, but it's going to be coming out at a higher temperature even if you have some significant irreversibilities in the compressor. So this would be like two actual. Then where is state three? It's still saturated uh, liquid at that high pressure. A little tricky now, state four. On a TS diagram, it's a little hard to see. On a pH diagram, pressure enthalpy, it's really easy because it would be right below three. But here, do I draw it as a solid line indicating it's reversible expansion through the expansion valve? Or should I draw it as a dashed line between state 3 and 4, indicating irreversibilities? Dashed line, dashed line. And state 4 should have a higher S than state 3. It should not be dashed line straight down, no. Higher S because of irreversibilities in that expansion valve. Okay. So... Now we ask, how do I calculate that metric of performance? Well, here, maybe go back and say, what do I want to achieve? I want to get a large cooling in the evaporator. So a Q evaporator divided by what I have to pay for uh, the work to drive the compressor. You can now work this out and get it in terms of different differences in enthalpy, H, uh, 1 minus H4 divided by H2 minus H1. Make sense? Right. Okay. Um, let's do this. How would I get... Well, when you're solving these problems, go ahead and make a table of uh, properties, right? That's standard recommended protocol. How many states do I have? One maybe 2S and then 2 actual if you have an efficiency for that compressor, then state 3, then state 4. You're interested in knowing the pressure, the temperature, often the quality, the enthalpy, and the entropy. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I can either jump to a actual problem or conceptually do this. Uh, do you want to do it conceptual? All right. So you only have two pressures. So this, for state one, what pressure is it? It's the low pressure, let's say PL, or just put low for L, L for low. So low, high, 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 low. There we go. Those are our pressures. Temperatures. Well, it's saturated vapor at that low pressure pressure, isn't that TSAT at that low pressure? How about state 2? Well, it's not so easy to get the temperature at 2. Uh, the quality here is 1. 
it's H of G and S of G, isn't it? So when you analyze the compressor, you first say, okay, isentropic. So S, uh, uh, this S1 is equal to S2. So S2 is equal to S1. Hence, you know the pressure and the entropy, S. You look up quality, not quality, H. So I'm going to expand it over here. I'm going to say H2S is H evaluated at the low pressure, or the high pressure, pressure high, and S2. We've done those calculations. Then what you do is you use the isentropic efficiency, the efficiency of the compressor. Is I'm sorry? Well, S1 is equal to S2. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a 2. I'm trying to find 2S. So I know that S2 is equal to S1. Yeah. And the isentropic efficiency of the compressor is going to be the um, lower amount of work if it was reversible. So H2S minus H1 divided by the actual H2 minus H1. Hence, using the isentropic efficiency, Having calculated H2S and H1, I get H2. So you calculate now H2. Should I write out that equation? H2 is equal to H1 plus 1 over isentropic efficiency of the compressor, H2S minus H1. Done it? Yeah, you've done enough of these. It's just like the vapor power cycles. Um and the gas power cycles. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to, you could calculate this temperature. Both of these are going to be a little interpolation. You can see it because they're out in the superheated region. So maybe it's a little extra work that you don't want to accomplish. What about state 3? Saturated liquid. So it's going to be H of F at that high pressure. Remember, the focus is on this H column in our property table because all our energy transfers really need those H's. Okay, and then how about the last one, H4? How do I find H4? It's equal to the H3. That's almost too easy. Right? So it's the same. The same. H4 is equal to H3. Then you make your calculations. Okay. Well, with that, that was a big introduction to the vapor compression refrigeration system. I have a problem here, but we just worked it out conceptually. It's exactly what we just worked out. I was going to give the temperature of the evaporator, which essentially dictates the pressure in the evaporator because it's two phase. And then the temperature in the condenser that gives us the pressure in the condenser so this is my low pressure this is my high pressure uh, I was going to say the standard hey saturated vapor exits the evaporator that's the inlet to the compressor and saturated liquid exits the condenser and that's inlet to the expansion valve give a uh, isentropic efficiency for the compressor to make it more challenging Give a mass flow rate of the refrigerant so that you could first calculate kilojoules per kilogram and then multiply by kilogram per second to get your kilowatts and then ask you to make these calculations. The one coefficient of performance, look at that. Hey, I got a 2.49 coefficient of performance. I must have an error. No, you can have a coefficient of performance greater than one. Yeah, you can. No, it does not have to be. You can get a coefficient of performance of 0.3. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, in some systems, you, you're forced to have a lower than one coefficient of performance. It's still going to cool, but it's going to take a lot of energy to provide that cooling. Typically, there's a high delta T temperature difference. Here are the numbers and the numbers. Here is it plotted on a temperature entropy diagram to scale. This is the low 
pressure down in here. I didn't even extend it out, but you could see that that's that evaporator pressure or evaporator temperature. I forget what it is. What was it for this problem? Four? Uh, yeah, four degrees. All right. And then you put it Iceland Tropic from state one to state two, 2S, but then you have that uh, isentropic efficiency of the compressor, that's two actual. All of these have the same pressure. This is my high pressure so line. So when I start to condense, guess what? I first have to cool it before I can get it to be saturated vapor before I start to condense. All right? So this is cooling at relatively higher temperatures than the majority of the heat rejection at that um, lower temperature, which was about 50 something, 52 degrees or something. Now this is state three, saturated liquid coming out. If it would be perfect, if I had a turbine there, wouldn't it be the best would be straight down on a TS diagram? But we actually put it through a valve and you would think that the valve would kick it out way over here and be a whole lot different than having the quality um, between the one with the valve versus just the expansion valve, uh, or the turbine and versus the expansion valve. But look it, it's not that bad, is it? They have about the same quality. I know it's a little higher, but it's not dramatically higher quality. So there's still a lot of fluid at state four in the liquid state ready to evaporate that provides the cooling. All right. All right, so let's take a look at some of the components. One of the components is the evaporator. Uh, you have fluid coming in and fluid coming out of the evaporator like that. And uh, this was state one coming out, and this was state uh, four, four going in. So that's the evaporator. Answer this question. The pressure at one compared to the pressure at four. Is the pressure at one greater, equal, or less? Answer A, B, or C. Tell me a little bit about the pressure. Is the pressure at one greater? Answer A. Is the pressure at one equal to four? Answer B. Is the pressure at one less than P4? Answer C. That's actually pretty good for a class. I'm impressed. So now we continue. Tell me a little bit about the quality at one versus the quality at four. Is it greater, equal, or less? Answer A, answer B, or answer C. The quality at one versus the quality at four. All right. So what was our standard assumption about the uh, state one? It's saturated, saturated vapor, isn't it? So what's the quality of saturated vapor? 100%. A lot of times the quality at four will be 20%, 30%, somewhere in that vicinity. So a lot of you had that right. So the quality at one is greater than the quality at four. All right, you're doing well. Let's continue on. The temperature, here, I can reuse this over here. Instead of the pressure at one, put the temperature at one versus the temperature at four. Yeah, we show the results. Well, they're equal. Uh, we just said that the quality over right here was about 25%, and the quality over there is 100%. That means they're under the dome. I know one's at the edge of the dome, but uh, they're at the constant pressure. Same temperature. Same temperature, right? Very good. All right, then we can ask this one. Enthalpy at 1 versus the enthalpy at 4. What about the enthalpy? So... Let me ask this question um, as a backup a little bit. A lot of you got it right, but I'm just going to ask a question. Can you tell me a little bit about the difference between H of G and H of F? Which one's larger at the same pressure, same, you know, pressure? 
HG is larger, isn't it? And then, so HG is uh, um, greater than H of F. Okay. Now, also, if I have a fluid in a two-phase, H is equal to H of F plus the quality times H of G minus H of F. Is that equation correct? Yes. Yeah. And so as the quality goes up, enthalpy goes up. Right, very good. Let's just grade this one. So H1 is greater. H1 is greater. Okay. Um, the last one I'll do for this evaporator is S. I mean, if you get this many correct, you're doing really well. Tell me a little bit about the entropy, S. S1 versus S4. Very good. I'm impressed. Wow, you're learning thermodynamics, uh, which is great. Let's talk about the compressor. What's after the compressor? Not state one, but state two. How does the hmm, temperature at two compare to the temperature at one? And I'm going to say temperature 2S, temperature 2S as if it's isentropic compression. Well, think about that TS diagram. It went way up. So the temperature at 2 is much greater than the temperature at 1. All right. What I need to do is I'm going to scoot this one over a little bit, and I'm going to just move it over here maybe. All right. Now what we're going to do is we'll continue the discussion what is the component that goes right here? I forgot the name of that one. Condenser. Yeah, condenser. And then we have expansion valve coming out, right? So this is state three. Uh, tell me a little bit about the temperature 2S versus the temperature at state three. And let's show the results. I'm going to have to think of harder questions. All right, I got a hard one now. No, 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 no. The pressure at 2S versus the pressure at 3. Man, I got to think of harder ones. Uh, all right, I'm going to work on this one about uh, the entropy and the entropy. Well, I got to think of some harder questions. Man. Uh, okay, I did, the, I did the pressure, I did the entropy. How about this one? Um, H... Uh, 3 versus H4. <laughs> hey, we haven't really had one that's completely 100%. If we get 100%, No. <laughs> Ice cream party? <laughs> Uh, next E week, we'll go and get free ice cream. I didn't buy it. <laughs> All right. Really, when you think about it, that's three and one. There's four people either randomly playing. There may not even be in the room. All right? Do the number thing. S3 versus S4. S3 versus S4. All right, let's see the results. All right. What? There's four again. That's the pattern. There's four. Okay. Um, Everybody click, um, everybody click on E.
Everybody. E. 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 Stop. Are we going to be 100% or are there going to be four outliers? Okay. <laughs> all right. So that's all I've got for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Yeah.